Hello, everyone. This is our newest episode. Hopefully, it's uh, something that we can continue for a very long time. Um, this is an idea that I had because the coverage of newsletter is so rich with information. I thought, why not have a week in review? So tentatively, we're going to call this This Week in Coverager, but uh, we'll leave the title up in the air uh, for now. And as you can see, I have uh, the leaders of Coverager, Sheffi and Avi. Welcome to our first episode of This Week in Coverager. Hi, everyone. Hello. So um, let's kick this off by, um, you know, Sheffi, I'll kick it over to you. Was there anything uh, particularly noteworthy? Um, on the different sets of articles that were uh, published or posted this week in, in coverage. Uh, biggest story, still developing story, is everything that happened with AIG and Blackboard. So to recap, AIG announced that it's uh, placing Blackboard into a runoff. And you know, Blackboard is their technology-focused subsidiary a team of maybe around 140 people. So it was a shock. And, you know, when we wrote the article and we kind of looked at the timeline, AIG said that they made, or they came to this conclusion during March. But for Blackboard, it's been business as usual and actually heightened business at least since April. So we're talking hiring people, let you know, hire up people bringing them into Blackboard, you wouldn't do that if you think if you didn't think that this journey is going to last. Um, it was talking a lot more state filings that we've seen, especially in April. Uh, and even, you know, this, well, it was even like a day before the announcement was made. So this makes me think that, you know, there's obviously a disconnect. A yes, bit of disconnect I was going to say that, yeah. Blackboard management and, and AIG. And, you know, the tagline, when, when I wrote about erasing Blackboard, I was just, I was thinking of Blackboard, but then I, I saw that Blackboard uses the word to, it, it's for them, it's about erasing inefficiencies. And to me, like in insurance, it's hard enough to erase inefficiencies. It's even harder to erase politics. And I think, you know, using coronavirus, that is the lamest excuse because this is not a, uh, a pandemic led, that this has to be something else. There's more to this story. Obviously there are a lot of players um, in the room here and Avi can talk more about that because you're talking about um, a collaboration between Two Sigma IQ, between Attune, between Blackboard, even for us to understand what each one brings to the table um, was confusing at times. But at the end, and I, and I think based on also feedback that Avi got from speaking to different individuals, you know, Blackboard had, from an innovation standpoint, a really solid product in an area that we don't see innovation a lot. So Avi, I think you can add some more color to this. I think it's interesting because uh, hearing uh, beyond the industry, everybody talks about uh, COVID-19 in the sense of, let's be more efficient, uh, let's do things in a better way, let's cut costs. And speaking with uh, Blackboard employees, they really believed in the platform. Um, they said how the technology was a real game changer. And these are people that have been in the industry for a very long time. So you gotta give them credit that they know what they're talking about. Yeah. So why would you, you know, seal that off? Why would you do that? if? it is an innovation unit they are being more efficient why wouldn't you want to actually invest more and you know see how you can expand and on that unit and to me again when it, it was a surprise for many of the employees uh so how was, was aig really committed to innovation if the innovation unit was you know they they didn't see it coming so th that's to me like is the why would you do it then? Uh, I don't understand. Why would you invest even that money? It may not be so much for AG, but why would you even go on a journey knowing that you don't want to see it through? Do we do we know any of the history with Blackboard? And um, by that I mean, is was it a uh, shell company that had existed before that got transformed into Blackboard, or was it an insurance company that was just sprouted out from scratch 
with uh, licensing. So I'm trying to understand, um, you know, how much capital commitment AIG had towards keeping that thing alive. I, uh, I, to me, I think one of the uh, least underrated aspects or advantages that an insurance company has is that license. And uh, to just kind of shudder, not that they're giving up that license, I don't think that's what they're doing, but to just sort of shudder it um, and keep it alive but not have it accept any business is a big head scratcher to me because it's like, they were, they, I thought they were using it for the thing that uh, was the most valuable. Uh, do, you, <clears throat> do you know any of the background around Blackboard? Well, it was basically Hamilton, USA, right? That was, that was the Oh, that's thing. right. And it uh, swapped and rebranded into Blackboard, which was a, I thought was a great brand. Uh, obviously, new website looked, looked fresh. Brian Dubrow came from Hamilton, USA, and was worth the fire for $110 million. Um, But I think even a bigger scratch in my head is still how the whole announcement came down. Because when AIG went to the press with their earnings call, um, through, during the evening, Blackboard management said, hey, you know, we're, our plan B is basically to look for an investor or someone that will help us continue on our own. Now, keep in mind, even if Blackboard will find a suitor, AIG has to approve of that suitor. Right. So they, they could have made a joint statement once and eliminate eliminated all the confusion that we feel that the people that we speak with um, are sensing, but they didn't do that. So what happened to the whole, we're a team? Yeah. And, and the truth is, I don't, I don't think AIG is a really solid team. I, I think there's so much history behind that company and people that are currently driving the lead at AIG, Brian Dubrow, uh, Peter, We've, you know, Peter was uh, described to Avi as a numbers person. And, and Blackboard right now isn't really about numbers. It's about establishing um, or realizing how to use technology in an efficient manner. And truth be told, it is only this year that they've actually started to make um, good effort and see return on how they were, you know, playing around with technology. It takes exploration especially in middle market. I think, um, to me, I think in general, and this is something that we see in coverager and um, sometimes at least I, I kind of, I feel like I make that mistake. It's not fair to judge startups or uh, you know, innovative initiatives over such a short period of time. We're forgetting that a lot of these big insurance companies that are big today have been in business for hundreds of years. It took them time to get to where they are today. And if you don't remember how long it took you to be what you are, and you're not giving enough time for new ideas, new products to shape and you know have that impact, then it's not fair. Because again, you had that time, you, you did it. No one was coming every year saying, oh, your loss ratio is this, or you lost like that, or because AIG talks about cost cutting all the time. So they could have made some cuts at Blackboard, made it even more efficient. Maybe they didn't need 140, 150 people. Sure. But just like AIG doesn't need all these people. So I feel like they don't treat sometimes a lot of these uh, innovation units and startups in general as an industry, I feel, as uh, someone you know of their own and that's here to try to do something better. Yeah. But that's a really good point because when we were covering layoffs of InsurTech, well, because of the pandemic. So firing people should be the last resort. You could reduce hours, you could ask to reduce uh, certain units. You don't just, you know, there has to be something more that says, okay, we're, we're placing Blackboard into runoff, and, but the way they also communicated it is also an issue. So do you it down for AIG? It's, it's hard, to me, it's hard to think, think through the long term when you're being measured quarterly. And um, that is, you know, it's a, I think it's a conflict between how we, you know, Avi, I don't know if it's fair or not fair. It's just that um, 
I don't, I don't, they, we're not using the same set of metrics. And so if AIG is judging their performance quarter by quarter, Blackboard never had a chance. Yeah, no. you're right. So and, why drag innocent employees into this? And promise them uh, big stuff. Why would you do I think, it, you know, at, at some point, and in, in, aren't we sort of seeing this across the board where it's like, these innovation arms of these insurance companies haven't really delivered anything. And it was something that I've been worried about all along. I worked at a carrier that had an innovation lab. And I remember going down there being all excited and just watching a bunch of kids playing with drones. And I said, nothing is going to come out of this. They might even build some tech, but this will never see the insurance light of day. No one's going to connect this to insurance. And that, that sort of that experience sort of stuck with me through this. And now we're seeing a lot of these in innovation arms, they're just quietly disappearing, fading away. And it's, um, I think it's a big concern going forward with insure tech. I think given the pandemic, I think a lot of, a lot of insure techs probably will go out of business. Uh, I think that's, that's a problem. And if the insurance industry itself can't figure out how to support these new technologies, I kind of throw my hands up in the air and like, what, what is going to happen here? A fintech company will figure out how to support these technologies and backtrack into internet. You know, I think, um, somebody's going is, to have, you know, somebody's going to figure out how to do things. Yeah. It may not, it may not be from insurance and it may require insurance companies to look beyond insurance to figure a lot of these things. But I mean, this is an interesting point, and this brings back to uh, the Metro Mile story, which did not happen last week, but I think it's relevant. So Metro Mile, that was something interesting when I was speaking to employees. They kept on comparing themselves to Root, and they looked at Root as a company that is growing uh, in an unsustainable way. And every uh, Metro Mile employee that I spoke with kept on saying how Metro Mile is profitable. And I was saying, what do you mean profitable? Their loss ratio they had in the 70s while Root was you know, over 100. And they looked at that measure and they said, we're doing something right. We're growing the right way. Of course, their combined ratio was very high because they were so focused. I, think, I really think they took a lot of the criticism by some industry experts saying, uh, you need to look at your loss ratio or don't grow too fast or things in that nature they actually improved their loss ratio over three years but then look what happened uh they were very slow root in the meanwhile was running and running and running and you know not stopping for a second to think uh and i really think that it hurt them so they kind of they listened to the advice but it hurt them so to to me this is a question i want to ask you what where's the balance so you say don't grow too fast but then when you try to focus, then you have, you have to pay engineers and data science people and your know, technology costs money and investors give you a lot of money to grow fast. That's the idea of getting a investment. So where is the balance? Should insurance startups raise less money? I, I don't know the answer to that. I know that one, one difference between insurance and other industries where, uh, you know, take tech for instance, where it's completely acceptable to lose money on your product over a considerable period of time. Uh, the problem with insurance is that nobody wants to buy it. And so if you're losing money on it, it probably means you have, you price you're probably pricing wrong or a combination of you have, you have the wrong customers and that's not easy to fix no matter how much money you throw at that. So to, you mentioned the, uh, the loss costs for some of these, that ends up becoming the key metric because for a lot of these companies and, and insurance has a long history of seeing this companies that grew really quickly with big loss costs. Then when they try to get the loss cost out of, under control, they lost the customers, right? Cause it was, it, they were the only reason they got the customers cause they were the cheapest and they got the wrong customers when they raised the price, you know, it, they did get the loss costs under control, but they shrank dramatically it's a big difference in in how investors come into insurance what their expectations have to be and, and avi i will i will tell you even from my personal experience 
um, I've struggled to reconcile whether insurance is a venture worthy business because I just don't think this type of business can withstand losses going out indefinitely to acquire other um, aspects of the business like market share. It has never worked ever. And we have a long history of this. It has never worked. It is not technology. You know, it's uh, interesting. I, I like to always say that insurance, when you sell insurance, it's not like you're selling a t-shirt, large, medium, extra large. They all same price, but insurance, you get one price. You think it's fair. I get another price. I'm not buying it. I don't think right. it's fair. And that is another challenge where you say grow really fast. There's a thing called conversion rates and fair is different to different people. Yeah. And that is another element. And then you mentioned, well, you attract the wrong customers. And when you do try to become profitable, you increase that rate and then you see uh, cancellations. So this is a really, you know, a big question. Maybe, maybe there's a different way to come and try to figure out insurance, maybe provide value in a different way. Like, okay, so a customer knows, well, insurance is included, but something else. So yeah, if I look at the insurance, it's more expensive than let's say Geico, but I'm getting something else. So it's kind of, you know, let me stay. Yeah. Well, you, you brought up the t-shirt uh, analogy and I like that. Um, let's say it, with marketing and costs, it costs you $2 to make a t-shirt. And let's say you want to get market share, so you're going to sell it for a buck fifty. You're going to take a 50 cent loss. Insurance doesn't work that way. Insurance is, uh, is a leveraged product. So you, you amplify the loss. That's the problem, right? You can, you can undercut your, your competitors but you do so in such a way where it's like, I'm not losing $50 a policy per year. I'm acquiring a group of customers that are going to file claims where I could lose many, 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 many multiples of that $50 I didn't get in the premium. That's the challenge is that the, the product that you're delivering is a leveraged product. You pay, you know, my... Uh, a homeowner's policy, you pay $500 for a $500,000 uh, return. If you get the wrong customer, you're going to be writing $500,000 checks. Why? Because you didn't charge enough. You know, you didn't discourage them. You know, the, the lowest priced a company um, in insurance has to have such a strong um, back office, strong analytics, strong fraud detection, like the system has to be built out because they're on their backs. They're sort of assuming with the undercutting of price that they're going to get people who are scrupulous. Is that the right word? <laughs> Is it in It's always cons like conspicuous and scrupulous. I never know if I'm using it the right way. The Israelis in the room. <laughs> so, it, that, you know, like... Uh, so look, look at this whole Metro Mile and Route system. Like personal auto is already super competitive and you have gigantic balance sheets and risk, you know, the risk of someone driving is just one element of the premium. The other element of the premium is, you know, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway and Geico have a, are growing rapidly. Why? He wants access to that cash. He has a balance sheet that can make the premium really cheap. So he's trying to balance, uh, you know, trying to get the, the safest drivers while also making sure that he's got a continuous amount of cash that's coming in that he can invest. That's tough to compete against when you're a Metro Mile or whatever, and you're, you know, or a route, and your, your, your business model is, is completely on the risk element of the business. And you get you get no additional benefits from having a strong balance sheet. That's tough. You know. Yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, what What else happened this week in Coverger? Oh, wait, wait. Before Before we leave so, uh, this topic, because uh, we we Sheffy, we talked about this a little bit before we hit record button. Um, AIG also had another announcement. Yes. Um, well, calling the, the pandemic uh, the biggest catastrophic event. Yes. And so we went from, 
I'll tell you as an insurance professional, um, you know, this started to occur. You started to see uh, a lot of insurance professionals speaking on Twitter and their blog posts talking about uh, nothing to see here. Really no worries uh, that we have to worry about because there's tight exclusions when uh, SARS hit. All of these, all of these uh, property casualty companies came in and they put these exclusions and one by one, the dominoes are falling. Arch, AXA, Hanover Re yesterday announced the charge. AIG, one by one, we're, and we're talking already just in a handful of companies that's already like a billion dollars and didn't Munich Re just announce something as well? So AIG might be right. This, this could end up being... Uh, spread out, it could be the largest catastrophe ever to beset the insurance industry. Yeah, I think the, to me, one of the most interesting uh, elements is if this will become a habit. So, you know, looking back, for example, at Nationwide announcing a hybrid model of work from home and, you know, work from the office, will this become a habit where maybe people go out, go less to restaurants? Uh, will this become a habit where now restaurants are going to say, yes, let's become those virtual kitchens. And that has significant implications for a commercial insurer insuring restaurants. Will we see less, everybody saying uh, less commercial real estate? What is that going to do to a lot of uh, commercial insurers in that space? So that to me is the ultimate question. Is this a temporary thing or will this become a habit? And individuals and companies are going to say, Hey, we could save money like every, because everybody cares about themselves. Like if you're a restaurant owner, if they tell you, look, you could make 50% more versus uh, when you have dine in, then unless you really want to see that, you know, experience on, on that diner's face, then you're probably going to say, yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's be efficient. Everybody wants to be efficient. So that to me is a interesting, will it become a habit? Will people travel less for business, uh, more zoom calls, less, you know, conferences, that is an interesting point. And if it does become a habit, I think it's going to affect many companies in many different ways. Yeah. Shafi? I was looking for the actual quote, but yeah, we're, we're pretty right. Uh, we're pretty spot on. So they called it the largest catastrophe event in the industry's history. I think I've read a lot of earnings calls recently just about the, the COVID and everybody has a different way of framing it. Some prefer to be on the super negative side and some prefer to look on the bright side. And I get there's a lot of uncertainty and there's short-term impact and then there is long-term and we don't know really what the long-term is. We talked a little bit about, about this earlier, right? You don't know when they're gonna make a claim. But if you start framing it by line of business, I want to believe that it's not all doom and gloom, right? We have to treat small business differently than we have to treat the travel insurance industry, which has probably hit the most. And we don't know, you know, how, how the behavior is going to pick up. If it does pick up, when it will pick up. I, I do believe that it, it will pick up, but I just, you know, I don't have a time frame for it. Life looks very differently right now. So it didn't impact really mortality rates just yet, but we don't know if that's going to come. Uh, in three months down the line, or, you know, what is that going to look like? But I, I just felt like with AIG, it was also, you know, just the darkest picture possible. Um, and we don't even know if they're being conservative based on what they, they're seeing in their books or not. I, I'm worried about that. Like, based off of the number that they set aside, um, is this like asbestos? where it's just like every earnings season, the, the, the reserve amount just keeps inching up and inching up and it goes from 250 million to five, to a billion, to 1.5 billion, to, oh crap. <laughs> like that it, it's, uh, it's completely possible. And I think the other shoe is, um, has not dropped yet. So I think all you need is one court to come in all you need is um a regulator and it's not even whether you win or lose the claim it's you're gonna have to defend those claims and there's gonna be a massive cost around that and then i think the final shoe to drop is that if once these settle i fully expect that policyholders will begin suing their brokers 
I, I agree and I agree on that. I know of a few brokers that are really afraid. There's no other way to put it. Uh, from customers, they're very careful with what they say. They try to refer them to the carrier directly, not saying much, uh, checking that they have an e and policy in place. Uh, because you know what? I think this is a big problem for an industry, and I wrote a, a, about this. How is it that you have so many brokers that everybody talks about the value of an agent and giving advice and, and all that, and then so many people are genuinely surprised that their uh, business interruption uh, coverage does not cover a pandemic or it needs to have physical damage for it to be covered. Like no one reads the policy. Yes, it's the responsibility of the policyholder, but why is an agent getting money every year and not making sure customers are aware? And I want to ask you another question. Why in January, because everybody talks about insurance, we're risk mitigators, we prevent risk and prevention, all that. You saw what's happening in Asia. You couldn't give a notification to restaurant owners say, listen, we don't know if this is going to be a big deal or not, but if you don't have delivery and takeout, because that's what they, they do in Asia, maybe you should get it in place instead of having businesses like scrambling last minute trying to figure it out. And maybe you could have minimized the losses a little bit and you could have delivered better service and you would have been, uh, I would say, a more positive light. Yeah. I, I think it gets back to what Sheffy was saying on how does insurance evolve? from here what what are we are we are we just transaction takers um i i'll tell you like that that seems completely unsatisfying right now to just sell insurance and i see no way around it avi if if we are what we say we are this industry then we have no choice but to start to really begin to partner on the risk management side you're 100 percent correct like that we do that for hurricane already. When a hurricane's coming, we start to give advice about things that you should be doing. No one stepped up on this. It's really disappointing. Yeah, you know, you. this is something that I don't think anyone has ever experienced, maybe in 1916 or, or something back then. But I feel like today with modern technology, all you needed to do was, I don't know, turn on CNN or see the jokes that were made about Silicon Valley terrified from this virus, you know, way before the lockdown happened. And again, these are experts. We're talking about insurance experts, people that, you know, this is their living. They know how to um, mitigate losses. That's what they do. So I think it was a big communication problem. And you, you said, are we a transactional business? The reality is most agents, most insurance companies, they care about selling. Uh, th that's what they care about. Always bring on new clients. There's not much of an effort to look at servicing or, or going over the policy and making sure that you're covered. We bought coverage. We don't know if we're covered. We don't know. And I, I, yeah. even if I read it, I wouldn't understand. Yeah. Now we know. <laughs> I don't think we know. Now we know. But what we do know is we're going to see a significant rate increase. <laughs> That's what we do know. We didn't file a claim, but we're going to see a, a rate increase. Okay, so so maybe we can kind of finish it off here because I'm now hearing rumblings from a lot of insiders that um, the market is going to significantly harden. So you're starting. So we're getting into the main uh, one of the main renewal seasons uh, for natural catastrophes. So the reinsurers are already starting to pass on significant rate increases. I'm seeing it as well. I think it's going to accelerate. Are you okay. hearing anything? We're going to shut down our bank account, to cancel all the credit cards, let them try to collect the money. I haven't. I mean, I've heard as much as you do that see it coming, especially in commercial insurance. But we saw a sixty percent increase in one case. Someone uh, uh, talks about yeah. that. Uh, yeah. Which you know that that seems significant, sixty percent. But uh... so I I think the industry is very well equipped to kind of muster through this. Uh, for one thing, I think it's going to be very much spread out. Um, this this will be a global phenomenon. It'll hit balance sheets all over the place. Um, I don't think this will necessarily put any individual company out of business. It'll hurt a few. But I think even if we do get to, if um, AIG is correct, and this is a hundred plus billion 
uh, loss event, right? Um, I think the industry can withstand that because it's going to be very spread out. Usually when natural catastrophes occurs, it's predominantly the reinsurers that kind of take it, you know, with their big balance sheets because they start to hit these very high totals and the reinsurers start to really pick this up. Um, I think it'll be carrier driven and reinsurance driven. My big concern is going into this hurricane season. Can we withstand this in a major hurricane? Right. And when's the last time we had a Calif a major California earthquake? Like I'm getting a really heavy feeling in my gut that the, um, you know, the planets are aligning here and 2020 could ultimately be like a just absolutely off the charts, catastrophic year in ways that we have never even imagined. So I'm like my finger is across that somehow we just get through this hurricane season and we can go into you know, and get past this pandemic and kind of take a, take a deep breath here. But that's my big concern. 2020 has been a very bad year in general, a really, really b bad year, but all we can do is r really hope and um, we hope for the best. Yeah. Um, so this is um, coverage your week in review. And I, I hope you like the format. We'll go deeper into some of these, uh, particular news topics that, um, as as we were saying before, Sheffy, um, you know, with with tight deadlines, sometimes it's we got to get the story out. But in this particular case, we're going to be able to digest a little bit more. So for the audience that's listening, there, you know, if you have feedback on how you would like this to look or if any particular articles during the week, send us a note, and we'll be sure that we can digest it. Or if they have any questions. Yes. Yeah, we'll chew them over. Yeah. Maybe we'll have them as guests. Why not? Yes, because we have the technology. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Sheffy, thank you. Avi, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for everyone that's listening, stay safe. Uh, this is the Coverage Your Week in Review. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.